The words to which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in the Gospel according to St. John, in chapter 5 and verse 44, the 44th verse in the 5th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only. How can you believe that receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from the only God? I come back once more to a consideration of this great and most vital and important verse. We began the consideration of it last Sunday evening. And then I pointed out uh, something that I must repeat this evening because it's so important to remember it, that this verse, in a sense, can be regarded as the end of the argument of the discourse which our Lord had with and addressed to these Jews. You remember the whole situation. He is confronted by a number of people who don't believe in him. And he's amazed at them. Because he's just worked a very remarkable miracle, and they knew about that and had heard of other miracles which he had worked. And yet they don't believe in him. They argue with him. They remonstrate with him. Indeed, they charge him virtually with being a blasphemer. And our Lord goes on talking to them in order to try and bring them to a knowledge of the fact that he is the Son of God. He has already told them that. These things I say that he might be saved. That's his object. He has one motive, one object only. And that is that these people might be saved. And having argued with them and having brought his demonstrations having adduced his proofs of his claims to be the Son of God and to an equality with God, he is now at the very end just trying to show them the terrible condition in which they are. He's trying to make them see why it is they don't believe in him. He has given them certain answers to that question already. He says that they don't want to come to him. The trouble is in their wills, not in their intellects. He will not come unto me, that he might have life. They don't understand him. They think that he has come and he's anxious to receive honor from men. He says, I am, I receive not honor from men. He tells them that he knows that the love of God isn't in them. He tells them furthermore that he knows very well that they can easily be duped, that they imagine that they're clever, that they're men of discrimination and understanding, but he says, like your forefathers before you and like those who are going to follow you, if a man comes in his own name, you're always ready to believe him. Because I've come in the name of God, you don't believe me. Truth forever on the scaffold. Wrong forever on the throne. And now here in this verse he comes to his final statement to them, his final argument. What follows is a kind of judicial abandonment. But here he is still, as it were, reasoning with them and pleading them. And he says, how can you believe that receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from the only God. Now, what I'm indicating is this. He says that he speaks these things unto them that they might be saved. To be saved means to be forgiven. To be saved means that all your sins are blotted out and that you're reconciled to God and have nothing to fear in life nor death nor in eternity. That is what is meant by being saved. It means being put into a right relationship to God for time and for eternity. 
And what our Lord is claiming, this is the claim of the whole of the New Testament, his claim is that there is only one way whereby men can be saved, and that is to believe in him. So that when he says here, when he asks his question, how can you believe? He means, how can you believe in me? That's the matter at issue. Why don't they believe in him? He says, this is the only way to be saved, to believe in me. Now, why don't you believe in me? Well, we spent our time last Sunday evening considering the negative answer uh, which he gives himself to his own question or to his own statement. Oh, and I must repeat it. Because you notice that what our Lord says, first of all, is just this. That there is one thing that makes belief in him an utter impossibility. And that is that we are the kind of people who live to receive honor one of another. He says you cannot believe while you are animated by that desire and by that motive. And we went into it in detail last Sunday evening. And my suggestion was that this is the most potent cause and reason for unbelief in the world tonight. The average man who doesn't believe in Christ, indeed all of them, they tell you in some shape or form that they don't believe because of their great brains and understanding, because of their knowledge, and a thousand and one other things. It isn't, says the Lord. It isn't. There is only one thing that makes it impossible for a man to believe, and that is that he lived to receive honor of others that his whole attitude is directed towards men instead of being directed towards God. Thank God that what determines whether a man believes or not is not his brain. If brain power and intellect and understanding was the determining factor, well, then it would be a very unfair way of salvation. The men of intellect and knowledge would have a great a superiority and a so much better chance than the man who happens to have been born without much intellect and ability and brain. But that isn't God's way of saving. Thank God this Christian way of salvation is one that I can take tonight or somebody else can take and go to a man in the heart of Africa who's never had a day or a second schooling and offer it to him. And he has an equal opportunity with the greatest philosopher in London at this moment. That's God's way. It isn't a matter of intellect. Thank God it isn't. No, no. It's this other thing that is common to the whole of human nature. This craving to be praised by one another. This living for one another and to be honored by one another. That's the fatal thing. That and that alone makes belief utterly impossible. Very well. There was the negative. Let me now proceed to the positive. Because our Lord says that these people are also guilty of something else, they not only spend their time in seeking honor one of another, because they do that, they do not seek the honor that cometh from God only. Now then, I call this the positive, because that's the way in which I want to take it. Seeking honor one of another makes belief impossible. What then makes belief possible? What is the attitude that leads to belief? Oh, here it is. It is to seek honor from the only God. Now then, that's the matter that we have before us this evening. These people, I say are in trouble, they don't believe in him, says our Lord to them, because they failed in both respects. And, as I say, they're indissolubly linked to one another. Very well, then the question that arises is this. What does he mean by seeking honor of the only God? Now, he says, if only you'd done that, you'd believe in me. This is the high road to believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Have we got it clear, my friend? Salvation results from believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Very well. The important question is, therefore, 
to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. How can I do so? What will bring me to do that? Our Lord himself answers this, the most important question that we can ever consider together. This is the question on which depends and on which is suspended the whole of our eternal destiny and future. To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. What leads to that? Well, here is his answer. It is to seek honor from God, the honor that cometh from God only. Now then, let me put this to your consideration in some two or three propositions. The first thing we have to realize that the end and object of salvation is to bring us to know God. Is it necessary that I should say that? Well, I'm afraid it's very necessary and very important, especially at this present time. How can I believe in Christ? Why should I believe in Christ? What is it that leads anybody to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Oh, there are many who would answer that question today by saying this. Are you in trouble? Are you unhappy? Are you miserable? Are you lonely? Are you suffering from some physical illness or disease? Do you want a friend? They say, now then, if you've got any one of these troubles or problems, come to Christ. Because Christ can satisfy all these needs. Doesn't matter what your need is, they say, come to Christ. He'll solve these problems for you. He'll heal your body. He'll take away your worries and anxieties. He'll give you a great joy in your heart and a wonderful peace. Come to Christ, they say. Are oh, you lonely? Well, he's a companion that'll never leave you, and he'll always be with you. Is that the way to come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Is that the way that men eventually end by believing on him? Do you start with any one of these problems which they have? You know that isn't what he says himself here. And that isn't what the Bible says anywhere. And this is most important. Because the first thing we have to realize about this gospel, if we're in any trouble about believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, the first thing I say we have to realize is this, that this gospel is something unique, it's something quite separate, it's unlike everything else that is in the world this evening. And you know the thing that differentiates it and separates it most markedly from every other kind of teaching is this very point which we are considering at this moment. There are many cults and agencies and religions and teachings in the world tonight that come to mankind and offer deliverance from worry, deliverance from anxiety, deliverance from misery and unhappiness and a thousand and one other things. They say, believe this teaching and you'll get rid of all your worries. You won't be ill any longer because there isn't such a thing as illness. You'll get rid of your pain because there isn't such a thing as pain. Believe the theory, and you'll be happy, you'll walk with a new step, and you'll be filled with joy, and your world will be wonderful. The cults teach that kind of thing. But that isn't Christianity. Why should I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, he says the reason... The only valid and the only true reason is this. Because it's something that arises in the context of God. Seeking the honor that cometh from God only. Now then, my friends, here is something I think that we are tending to forget at this present time. You know the real trouble with the world still is that it isn't interested in God. And I'll tell you another thing. The main trouble in the religious world is that it forgets God. 
The tragedy is today that as our Lord puts it here so plainly and clearly, we all start with ourselves. Here am I. What are my problems and my difficulties? And what I want is something that's going to help me and help me to get rid of my problems and difficulties and make me happy and do this or that or the other for me. I start with myself, I consider myself, I end with myself. And I'm prepared to listen to anything that can help me. But that's not our Lord's own message. You notice he does it exactly the other way around. He starts with God. He says, you people don't believe in me because you're not really seeking the honor that cometh from God only. Now let's examine ourselves in the light of this. I remember reading a book by a man some 20 odd years ago, perhaps nearer 25 by now. It had got a most arresting title and it was very true. The title of the book was Religion Without God. And it was the most devastating case the men built up, pointing out that how so much religion really was apart from God altogether. People went to church, he said, why? Well, they felt that they'd done a good deed and they felt a little bit happier for having done so. God wasn't in it at all. They were not seeking God. They just went out of habit or customer because they brought merit to them or something like that. And then they made use of Christianity and its teaching mainly in a psychological manner. Because, you know, people have often used Christ and his gospel as a pure bit of psychology. Nothing to do with the gospel, really. They've just been treating people psychologically in Christian terms. But, you see, our Lord won't have that. He says that he only comes in in the context of God. What he says here is this, you'll never truly believe in me until you've sought God. Even he is not an end in himself. His whole purpose in coming into this world and into this life was to bring us to God. Here then you see is his diagnosis. You people can't believe, he says, because you spend your time in seeking honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God. You see, he didn't stand before them and say, look here, don't be foolish, why don't you believe in me? If you believe in me, I'll heal your diseases, as I've healed that man just now. I'll give you happiness, I'll give you joy, I'll be with you as a... Com not a word. If you want to believe in me, he says, you better start seeking that honor that cometh from God only. Oh, here I say is the reason why men and women don't believe in Christ. It's because they don't believe in God. They don't know the truth about God. And therefore the most urgent matter before us is surely this. As to what he means by seeking that honor that cometh from God only. How do we do with this? What does it really mean in actual practice? Now I'm speaking to someone who doesn't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what I'm telling you, my friend, is that you're in that position not for the reasons that you imagine, not for your intellectual difficulties. I'll tell you why you haven't flown to Christ and pleaded with him to listen to you and to accept you. It's because you're ignorant of God and your relationship to God. You haven't sought the honor that cometh from the only God. Well, what does this mean? This is something, it seems to me, that I can put in the most convenient way in these terms. If we really want to know what it means to seek honor from God only, we can do nothing better than look at people who've done that. And you'll find a very wonderful account of such people in the 11th chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews. There are men, you see, who lived to seek that honor that cometh from God only. People like Abel, people like Noah, people like Abraham, people like Enoch. These are the people. Moses, David, these are men who spent their time in seeking the honor that cometh from God only. And that's the thing that made them the men they were. 
It's the life of faith, if you like. This whole attitude towards life in this world that is ultimately centered upon God. Well, now then, let me try and expand that to you. What does it mean to seek that honor that God alone can give? Well, obviously, the first thing it means is this. That we must believe that God is. Now, here I've got my verse from the sixth verse of that eleventh chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's it. That's just another way of saying what our Lord says here. It's a wonderful exposition, therefore, of this verse that we're looking at tonight. He must believe that God is. Now then, let's start at that point. Do you believe in God? Do you believe that God is? Is this at the center of your life and all your calculations and all your thinking? God. You see, those people who spend their time in seeking honor one of another, they never think about God at all. They may say their prayers mechanically, but that's not thinking about God. They don't live as under God. They don't really believe that God is. He's a term which they've never really thought about. No, no, this is the first thing we must believe, that he is. That there at the back of the whole of life and of experience and of everything is the everlasting God. Now, the next step obviously must be this one. How do I believe in God? How do I know that there is a God? How can I be certain of these things if I'm to base and to plan my whole life upon this? Well, says somebody, give, give me some help. Tell me what are the reasons for doing this and how can I know what is true? Now, here we come, you see, to the very dividing of the ways. The kind of man who lives uh, to receive honor from other men and uh, who thinks that that's the great thing in life, to be thought well of by others, to be a man of the times, abreast of the times, knowing all about the latest advances of knowledge. The typical modern men, not one of these anachronisms in the modern world called a Christian, but no, a man who rarely is a 20th century man. Now, such a man, you see, he takes his opinion, as we saw always, from men. But the man who seeks the honor that comes from God only is a man who realizes that that is totally inadequate. He is a man who of necessity begins to pay attention to this book. Here he is now, he is no longer seeking to be honored by others. He now wants this honor that comes alone from God. He says, well now then how can I find God, how can I know God? And he begins to philosophize. He examines nature, if you like, and he works out the argument, the design and the order. He listens to the argument, the so-called ontological argument. Oh, I needn't bother about these, these things, the various proofs of God that have been advanced and propounded by the philosophers. Yes, he'll go through them all. He said they're all right as far as they go, but I want something further. These all just leave me with a perchance, perhaps. The possibility, perhaps, a kind of intellectual certainty, but it's not enough. And then he's confronted by this book. A book that claims to be separate and unique and special. A book which, in which the writers say, The word of the Lord came unto me, the burden of the Lord. They come to this book which Jesus of Nazareth said he believed as the word of God. He quotes it, he obviously accepts it. Claims are made for, for, for this book. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, etc. All oh, these words, uh, says another one, the words of the prophets, they're not of some private 
interpretation. They are not something excogitated out of the mind of a man who may have been a great thinker. No, no. But holy men of God were moved, they wrote, as they were moved or carried along by the Holy Ghost. What I mean is that a man who really begins to seek that honor that comes from God only is a man who now is ready to say, well, very well, I can see that human opinions are fallible and they're not enough. I'm prepared to read this book. I'm prepared to consider its message. This is one of the high roads to belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're in trouble about believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, my friend, let me ask you a very simple question. Have you ever read the Bible? I mean by that, have you ever read it through? Have you ever read right through the Old Testament and the New? Because, you see, here is a book that claims to be something that has a unique authority on this very question we're considering to believe in God and to seek honor that God alone can give us. Here is the book of books on the subject. Have you ever read it? Have you ever read it on your knees? Have you ever really examined its case? Now tell me, have you? Or is this rather your position? Is this your story? That now and again you have a discussion about religion and Christianity with another man or, some, or a group of men. And you express your opinions. And you say, no, I don't accept that. And what I think is this and that. Is that it? No, that's not the way to seek honor that cometh from God only. No man really desires to know God, but that inevitably he comes to this book. He says, now here's the thing I want. I'm going to listen to this. He comes to it with an open mind. Because of the great and unique claim that it makes for itself. I'll give you additional reasons for saying that later on, but let me go on at this point with this argument. Having come to the Bible and having read it, one begins to see that this claims to be a revelation from God. What one reads here is that God spoke to a given servant like that man Moses and said, Moses, go and tell them, I am the Lord thy God, and I will not have any other God beside me, and you mustn't have another. He reveals himself. And the man who seeks to be honored by God is a man who looks at the revelation, and he begins to consider what he tells him about the being of God. God! is eternal, everlasting, without beginning or end, the everlasting God. God, he's omnipotent. There is no limit to his power. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's here. He's there. He's everywhere. He's in Australia. He's in this northern hemisphere. God is everywhere. That's what the Bible begins to tell him about the being of God. Oh, and God is not only great and almighty in these ways, he is holy, he is light, and in him is no darkness at all. He is just, he is righteous, God is the maker and the creator of the whole universe. He brought it into being. It isn't an accident. It isn't a matter of chance. It isn't something fortuitous. No, no. God has an everlasting mind and he plans and he purposes and he decided to create and he made. He said, let there be light and there was light. That's God. You see, if you're in trouble about believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, this is the way to begin. You don't start by arguing about miracles. You don't start by saying, now I don't understand two natures in one person. No, no. You seek the honor that cometh from God only. 
Seek God, the God who is, who was, the I am, what I am, and who I am. The eternal and almighty God. And then go on to consider what the Bible tells you about your relationship to this God and his relationship to you. And you'll find that it tells you very plainly and clearly that there are only two ultimate relationships to God and that is the relationship in which a man is blessed and the relationship in which a man is cursed. Now, this isn't my theory. It's God's revelation that I, living my life in this world and under that almighty God, though I may forget him, doesn't make any difference, he's there. And my relationship is either that I'm blessed by him or else I'm under his curse. Have you thought about this, my friend? Have you ever thought of explaining the state of the world today in terms such as this, that the world is as it is because it's under God's curse? That's what our Lord himself said. That's what the Apostle Paul taught in writing to the Romans. He said, you know, there have been epochs and eras in the life of this world when mankind, having refused the voice and the word and the law of God, God has handed them over to a reprobate mind. It says the apostle, when the world began to worship the creature more than the creator, well, the great creator then abandoned them uh, to themselves. And what did they do? Well, they then began, oh, the men began to put aside the use of the woman and desire the man and the woman put aside that which was natural and became unnatural. A woman with woman doing that which is unseemly and all the horror and the bestiality of the perversions and all the foul immoralities of life. That's the apostle's explanation. He says that is the curse of God. That's God abandoning the world to its own devices because it won't listen to him. Because it didn't seek the honor that cometh from him only. Oh, the man, I say, who reads the Bible uh, soon begins to realize these things, that it doesn't matter what his view is, that God is there, and that God's laws are absolutes, and that they've never been abrogated. And that the whole of life is either one of blessing or else of cursing. Well, then the next step is, of course, the next thing I've got to say about this man is this. The man who seeks that honor that comes from God only is a man, obviously, who bases the whole of his life upon this. This becomes to him the center of being. This is the one thing for which he lives. He says, what's the use of worrying about what other people think of me or say about me? What's the value of spending my time in getting things from other people? They and I will soon be dead, but God remains. The man who seeks the honor that cometh from God only has no time for anything else. He becomes desperate. He says, I must know him. I must find him and this blessing that he alone can give me. This becomes the central thing in his life. This is the way, do you see, to become a Christian. This is the way to become a Christian. No, no, forget your illness, forget your joy or misery. Say to yourself, do I know this God? Am I being blessed by him? That becomes the one thing that matters. Or if I may summarize it and close this section, let me put it like this. Seeking the honor that comes from God only means desiring to know God. Desiring to please, desiring to be blessed by God. You see, it's the exact opposite of the people we were considering together last Sunday night. They act like this, these people who seek honor one of another. They say, now, I want to know these top men. I want to get into the upper circles. I don't care how much it'll cost me. I may need an introduction. Well, very well, I'll pay 500 guineas for it. I don't care what it means in the matter of dress. I must have it. I want to meet the best people, turn into the highest circles. 
And they'll spend their time, their money, their energy in getting this honor that men can give them. Oh, this other man, he does all that and more in an attempt and a desire to have an entry, an entree into the presence of the everlasting God. To know him. To be able to speak to him. To go to him in trouble. To please him. To know his smile. To be blessed by him. To be enfolded in his arms and to feel that these everlasting arms are surrounding me in the time of my trouble and of my need. This is the way to become a Christian, to desire that. Have you desired that, my friend? Is that your ambition? Can you say to me honestly that you desire to know God more than anything else in life and in the world. If you can tell me that that is your supreme desire, well, then I assure you, if you're not already a Christian, you very soon will be. It's the higher road to believing in Christ and to becoming a Christian and to being saved. But you know, if you haven't felt this desire, if God is just someone that you turn to when you're in desperation, and only then, oh, you're not, you're not a Christian, and you'll never be as long as you're in that position. This is the road to Christ, seeking the honor that cometh from God only. Now then, that brings me to my last point this evening. Why is it that this should lead one to believe in Christ? That's the point, isn't it? He says that to believe in him is the thing that saves. He tells them that if they don't believe, it's because they're seeking honor one of another and are not seeking the honor that comes from God only. In other words, he says, if only you sought that honor that came from God only, you'd very soon believe in me. It's the whole way to come to me. It's the high road to believe in me. Why? Oh, I'm in no trouble about answering that question. Have you ever set out on the quest to find God? Have you ever sought him? Come, come, let's be practical. Do you know God? Is God real to you? In the moment of your agony, when you get on your knees in prayer, do you find him? Do you know he's there? Do you know God? Have you found God? Oh, my dear friend, I say, set out upon the quest. And as certainly as you do so, I'll tell you the conclusion you'll come to. That with all your seeking and searching and striving, you can't find him. You can't get there. He dwelleth in a light that is unapproachable. No man hath seen God at any time. Your highest philosophy can't arrive at him. The world by wisdom knew not God, says Paul, and it didn't. Have you ever tried? Well, try, I say. Seek to find him that you may receive the honor that he alone can give. And you'll find that you can't. Seek God and you'll feel hopeless. You'll feel helpless. You'll feel bereft and undone. You see, it's the high road to failure. Well, are you exhorting us to that, says someone? I am. I am. Seek God, I say, and you'll discover that you can't find him. Oh, that I knew where I might find him. Where is he? I can't arrive there. He's dwelling there. In that high and lofty place which is eternity. And I can't rise to such a height. 
And then I come back to my Bible. I say, very well, I agree with that now. I'm convinced I need a revelation. And I believe that the only revelation in the world this evening is that which is in the Bible. I don't care what the philosophers say or may say. They don't know. They're only men like myself. And I'm out for God. Very well, I'm going to listen to this which claims that it's God speaking and revealing himself. I'll come to it. What does it tell me? Well, what it tells me is this. That God is not the philosophic abstraction that I've been considering and arguing about. That God is, that God is a person. That God is uh, what I have already been trying to describe to you. That there he is, holy, everlasting and eternal. And that makes me feel more impossible than I did before. God seeth the heart. Ye are they, said Christ to Jews like these Jews, you are they that justify yourselves before men, but God seeth the heart. And that which is highly esteemed amongst men is abomination in the sight of God. And thus when I realize the truth about him, I realize I'm utterly hopeless. What can I do to come into the presence of God? Who am I in my sin and my vileness and my failure to approach such a presence? And then I consider his laws and his demands. And if I do this honestly, I'm driven to repeat those words that we've already been singing, written by Augustus' top lady, not the labors of my hands, can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. You see, the moment we truly seek God, we realize how utterly helpless we are, how hopeless we are, that we can do nothing, Seek the honor that cometh from God, and you'll find yourself groveling in the dust, a worm, a vile wretch, with nothing to commend you. And you'll feel you're damned to all eternity, outside the presence of God, and that you richly deserve it. And then... You go on reading your Bible because there's nothing else. No philosophies are value to me here. My friends can't help me. My boon companions make me feel more desperate. I want this God. I want to know him. I want to be blessed of him. I want to spend my eternity in his presence. But how can I? It's impossible. I'll go back. Is there a glimmer of a hope? And I find there is. I find that the first men that God ever made in his folly sinned against him and became an outcast and brought ruin upon himself and his progeny and his world. But I find that this God turned to him and said, Oh, you've done that. I'm going to punish you. Yes, I'll curse the ground because of you, and by the sweat of your brow, you'll have to earn your living in this world. And I'll put enmity between thy seed and the seed of that serpent that has led you astray. But the seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head. He's promised deliverance. That though man has been separated from God and banished and driven out of paradise and the flaming sword and the cherubim are there prohibiting his re-entry. There is going to be a way back. And God himself is going to provide it. So as I go back to my Old Testament, I start with this promise of the Deliverer. I follow it right through the scriptures that he's been talking about. The Moses that wrote, and all these scriptures about him, the promise of the coming one. And then I go over to my New Testament, and I read the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And here I begin to see it all. 
Seeking God has made me feel damned and lost. And now I am confronted by a Savior and an author of salvation. Do you know why you don't believe in me, said Christ to these people? You've never sought God. You see, you think that your religion puts you right. The fact that your dues put you right. You're relying on circumcision. You're relying on your knowledge of the law. You're relying on your religiosity. And therefore you don't believe in me. He said, if you really had sought God and the honor that comes from God only, if you'd ever really confronted the everlasting and the eternal, you'd feel so lost and damned and helpless and hopeless that when I came and when I manifested myself, you'd rush to me. You'd say, here's the promised Messiah. But you haven't sought that. You're self-satisfied. You're receiving honor one of another. You say, Rabbi, here's a learned man, here's an authority, and you pay your compliments to one another. Ah, while you're doing that, you'll never believe in me. But if you saw yourselves as poor and damned and benighted and lost, If you believed your own law that you claim to believe, you'd believe this, that there is none righteous, no, not one. That all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That by the law is the knowledge of sin, and the law therefore cannot justify. You'd realize that you're all under condemnation. And then in your desperation and your emptiness and your woe and your loss, and your fear and terror and alarm. When I appear before you, you'd run to me. You'd believe in me when I say that I've come to go to the cross to bear your sins and to take your punishment upon myself, to be buried in your grave, to rise again to justify you freely by the grace of God. Why, you'd rush to me in your desperate plight. You would turn to me and say, just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee. O Lamb of God, I come, poor, helpless, blind, sight, riches, healing of the mind, yea, all I need in thee to find. O Lamb of God, I come. Or if you prefer to say it with Thomas Binney, the man who has truly sought God and the honor that comes from God only is driven to say this. Eternal light. Eternal Light, how pure the soul must be, that placed within thy searching sight it shrinks not, but with calm delight can live and look on thee. Oh, how can I, whose native sphere is dark, whose mind is dim, before the ineffable appear? And on my naked spirit bear that uncreated beam. How can I? I cannot. It's impossible. I'm lost. I'm helpless. No, no. There is a way for men to rise to that sublime abode. An offering and a sacrifice. A Holy Spirit energy. An advocate with God. Oh, the moment a man has seen himself as a sinner. The moment a man has seen himself in the sight of God. And what awaits him in eternity. There's no need to persuade him to believe in Christ. He flies to me. Foul I to the fountain. Fly. There's no need to plead with people to come to Christ. When they've seen themselves before a holy God. They see their terror, their alarm, their hopelessness, their lost estate. They fly to him. How lie to the fountain fly. 
Wash me, Savior. Or I die. There's no alternative. If he doesn't wash me, I die. If I can't hide myself in that rock of ages that was riven and cleft for me. I am without hope. I am undone. I don't know God. I can't find him. His law condemns me. I have nothing to anticipate but eternal misery. But rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure cleanse me from its guilt and power. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? You know if you don't there's only one reason. That is you don't know God and you don't realize where you are. You don't realize your plight and your position. Seek God. And if you do so honestly and truly, you will be driven to the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank God. Though you make of him the last resort of a desperate sinner, he won't refuse you. He will receive you readily and gladly. He will take you under the shadow of his wing and you shall be his and he will present you to God faultless and blameless without spot, without blemish and with exceeding joy. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.